and God bless you this morning. Good to be in the Lord's house with you. Let's stand and we'll open our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are indeed grateful to be in your house this morning, Father, and Lord, we truly are thankful for your word this morning, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you would be in our midst this morning, Father, and bring your presence, Lord, and may we open our ears and our hearts, Lord, for our, your revelation that you would have for us this morning, Lord, and Lord, we truly want to come and join ourselves together, Lord, and grow a little bit more in the likeness of you this morning, Father. Lord, as we get ready, Lord, to prepare ourselves, Lord, for your coming. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> your only believe book number seven. When the redeemed are gathered in. <clears throat> I am thinking of a rapture in our blessed home on high When the redeemed are gathering in How we'll raise a heavenly anthem in that city in the sky When the redeemed are gathering in oh, When the redeemed are gathering in Wash like snow and free from all sin how we'll shout and how we'll sing oh, when the redeemed are gathering in. There will be a great possession over on the streets of gold when the redeemed are gathering in. Oh, what music, oh, what singing near that city be controlled when the redeemed are gathering in. When the redeemed are gathering in, washed like snow and free from all sin, how we'll shout and how we'll sing when the redeemed are gathering in. Saints will sing redemption stories with their voices clear and strong when the redeemed are gathering in. Then the angels all will listen, for they cannot join that song when the redeemed are gathering in. When the redeemed are gathering in, washed like snow and free from all sin. Oh, how we'll shout and how we'll sing. Oh, when the redeemed are gathering in. Then the Savior will give orders to prepare the banquet board when the redeemed are gathering in. And we'll hear his invitation, come ye blessed of the Lord when the redeemed are gathering in. When the redeemed are gathering in, washed like snow and free from all sin. How we'll shout and how we'll sing oh, when the redeemed are gathering in. Hey Amen. You're looking forward to that time. No, it's getting closer by the day. Amen. Let us take our prayer request before the Lord this morning. Has anyone got one they'd like to make known? <clears throat> prayer this morning for healing and you other spoken prayer request. <clears throat> for yes, amen. I thank the Lord for the healing that he's given to the lady. It's a pretty bad deal when you get burned. It really kind of, uh, not just the physical effects, but the mental effects too, you know, so uh, thank the Lord for the healing that they've given to her. Uh, continue to remember Sister Mary Hoffman in prayer. She continues to uh, be healed, and uh, we thank the Lord for what she's gained, and also for my Uncle Chuck, who's home now. So we pray that God would help them adjust while they're there, and that therapy continues to go good. Is it a return trip? 
Yes, and Brother Nathan and Sister Becky coming home from a nice, warm, sunny Florida. And, uh, amen, we can't complain. We've been blessed with some nice days here lately, and we thank the Lord that spring is here. Amen. Any other spoken prayer requests? <clears throat> amen. Uh, continue. Remember uh, Brother Mitch Fairweather in prayer. He had a quadruple bypass heart surgery, and uh, he's doing good. Uh, I think they took most of the stuff and the drains and stuff out uh, yesterday, so we thank the Lord that he is doing good. Uh, he is uh, Levon's nephew-in-law, and uh, we, we love Brother Mitch and Sister Debitha, so they're up there in Washington. Uh, continue to remember Suzanne Shear, Brother Bill Caldwell for health, and uh, also for Brother Edward. From the Lord's direction, Brother Roger for unspoken prayer requests. Also for our brothers and sisters in South Africa, the Bailey family. And then also our brothers and sisters in India and the churches there. Also for the missionary work that God will put on our hearts and Brother Brian's uh, heart this year. Also for Brother Don Hoffman and Sister Mary Hoffman and, and their endeavors there in uh, Minnesota. Also for Brother Billy Paul and Brother Joseph and the voice of God in their tour that they're doing. And if it, one gets close to you, hope you have the chance to go get to see them in their presentations. Uh, all our unspoken prayer requests this morning can be known by an uplifted hand, and we'll go to the Lord with prayer. Gracious Father, we indeed grateful, Lord, that all these requests have already been answered. Father, Lord, we do lift them before you, Lord, and we pray, Lord, for the the healing mercies and the tender touch, Lord, that you would give to these folks that we've mentioned to you this morning, Father. And, Lord, we pray that you would give them comfort in their body, Father, and also comfort in their spirit, knowing, Lord, that you are in control of everything. And, Father, we pray, Lord, that the endeavors, Lord, of the missions, Lord, that go on for this year, Father, we pray, Lord, that you're in every decision, Lord, and for the voice of God and Brother Joseph and Brother Billy Paul, as they continue to press forward, Lord, in the digital age, Father, we pray, Lord, that you give them directions, and Father, that your word truly does get to every last person, Lord, because as soon as the last person receives your word, Father, we know it would be time for us to go home, so Lord, we pray, Lord, that that would be a work that would be done quickly. Lord, we pray, Lord, also that the lifted hands this morning, Lord, and those that may be watching this morning that have a desire or even a spoken request, Lord, that they mention to you, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would grant them according to their needs, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing a one we haven't sung in a while. Number 24, Living by Faith. <clears throat> I care not today what the morrow may bring. If shadow or sunshine or rain The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything And all of my worry is vain Living by faith In Jesus above Trusting, confiding in His great love from a harm safe in a sheltering home, I'm living by faith, and I feel no alarm. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of light. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies The Master looks on at the stride Living by faith in Jesus above Trusting, confiding in His great love For I'm all harm and his sheltering arms I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm I know that he safely will carry me through no matter what evils be tied why should I then care though the tempest may blow if Jesus walks close to my side Living by faith in 
Jesus above, trusting, confining in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Oh, I'm living by faith in Jesus above, trusting confide. Being in his great love, from all harm safe, in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith, and I feel no alarm. Amen. As we get closer to the end, faith is more important. Amen. Uh, Brother Steve and Brother Don, if you would come this morning. Go ahead and take up our tithe and offering. <clears throat> Amen. Brother Steve, if you'd ask the Lord's blessing this morning. Heavenly Father, we're once again grateful to be in your house and to be in your presence, Father. And we're grateful also to keep your word by giving back to this tithe and offering. We ask you to bless us once again and may it be pleasing. <coughs> As we get older and as we get closer to the end, we realize leaning on him is more important. So let's sing number 45, leaning on the everlasting arms. <clears throat> <clears throat> What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms leaning oh yes we're leaning safe and secure from all along leaning oh yes we're leaning leaning on the everlasting arms what have I to dread what have I to fear leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. On the everlasting arms. Amen. When you find yourself in fear, just remember to lean on him. Amen. Because fear is of the devil. God and his word, and they, it brings peace. So anytime you face fear, you realize that you're fighting that battle. Just lean on the Lord. Amen. God bless you this morning. Let us stand and we'll sing only believe. As we ask Brother Brian to come. <clears throat> Only believe. Only believe. All things are. 
Gracious Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your presence among us this morning. We want to thank you, Father, for all that you've been doing in this hour, coming down with a shout, O oh God, with a message, uh, choosing a bride before the foundations of the world to hear it, to recognize it, and to act upon it, choosing a messenger to speak it, O oh God. And so, Father, we know that there are many things involved with your presence, and yet, Father, we know that we have entered into them. So help us, O oh God, to have a better understanding of the things that are going on in our midst. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, this morning will be number 86 in our series on the unveiling of God. And it'll be, I think, number three or four in uh, a mini-series we began on the two vines, which is also known as twins. And this morning we're going to look at the definitions because words have meanings. In our series on the unveiling of God, we began another mini-series on twins when reading paragraphs 99 through 102 of Brother Ram's sermon, The Unveiling of God. Now, since I don't wish to repeat this morning because it would just take us too much time to go through those four or five paragraphs and then continue on, it just we've already got 27 pages of notes and so we want to get through it. But we're going to look at, um, in order to understand the subject of twins, we must first understand the difference between foreknowledge, election, and predestination because you can get pretty confused if you don't understand them. Many people today, especially the fundamentalists and the evangelical, they differ greatly on exactly what election and predestination are or what they're all about. The main issue, however, has not been whether God predestinates or not as much as the issue of choice or rather whose choice. Men want so bad to be in control of their own lives that they have placed free moral agency as the ultimate in man's experience with God. Men, it seems, would rather have the ability to choose God than allow God to do the choosing himself. Thus, men will try to explain away election by using the word foreknowledge of God as their excuse to place man's ability to choose above God's own choice. Brother Bram even had a hard time with this because he said he'd go into, he'd go into congregations and the people get upset when he used the word predestination. So he, he tells us, and I'll give you several quotes where he does, where he, he reverted to the word foreknowledge to kind of appease the indifference of the people. All right. The Apostle Paul taught us in Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath, been, who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So it's all about him. It's, 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 it's of him and through him and to him. It's all about God. Now, we covered a, a series before we went into this one on sovereignty. And I think we would know by now that God's sovereign in his choosing. All right. Now, even Brother Ram, knowing how much men hate the word predestination, said that he would use the word foreknowledge instead to keep the people from fussing after he preached on the subject. And he also said that that is why he did not teach doctrine outside of his own church. Because, uh, but, the, the order, but the order is this. Foreknowledge first, because God is omniscient. Then being omniscient, he chose or he elected some to glory, and others were ordained to condemnation. That is what the scripture tells us. Then after choosing or electing, the pre, uh, he predetermines or predestinates our path to make sure all things work together for our good. So if you understand foreknowledge first, then election or, predest or, or, election or, uh, for, or, or uh, choosing, then predestination. Because God, you know, now Brother Ram said, well, God knew the end from the beginning, and therefore he, he predestinates. Well, okay, the word predestinate looks to destiny, all right? Foreknowledge looks to destiny. So you can, you know, that's how Brother Ram kind of married the two together, all right? Now, when he said every seed after its kind, God said that, he meant it. 
You cannot start out as a cockaber and end up a son of God. You cannot start out as a pig and end up a human. So when you hear Brother Ram substitute the word foreknowledge for the word predestinate, just remember these are two different words, and they mean two different things. Just like he said, the appearing and coming are two different words. They mean two different things. All right? Now, from, from a message he said, uh, he, he called Where I Think Pentecost Failed. And remember, just look at that title, Where I Think Pentecost Failed. But if we go back to find out when God made his first man, he made man in his own image. And God is a spirit, so he had to make man's spirit. Now, the word is used here in the, in the fifth verse of predestination. Predestinate. Now, it's not a very good word for an evangelist or a minister to use. Well, it's a good word, but for an evangelist or a minister to use, he says, because it's kind of confuses people when you say predestinate. Because people have no clue what it means. Predestination looks back to foreknowledge. Foreknowledge looks to destination. Predestination goes back to foreknowledge. Foreknowledge goes to destination. In other words, God didn't say... You know, and that could be more confusing now than ever, if you think about it. All right. But what he's saying is this. It all begins with, the, with God who's omniscient. In his thoughts, beginning, he predestined some. He foreknew them, right? All that he foreknew, he glorified, right? So God foreknew what your end would be. Not that God looked out and, 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 and saw you ended up this way. He foreknew you would be that way. And he predestinates you to be that way because by predestinating your path, because the Bible says a man shall choose his path, but the Lord directs his footsteps. All right, by predestinating that path, all things are going to work out for the good. You see? He's not predestinating your thinking. He's predestinating the seed. All right? So God brings you through trials and tests and everything else to get you to that place of glory. Or he brings you through trials and tests to get you to reject his word to that, and so you're ordained to condemnation. All right? Now... Predestination looks back to foreknowledge. Foreknowledge looks to destination. Predestination goes back to foreknowledge. Foreknowledge to destination. In other words, God didn't say, well, now I'll make this man be this, and I'll make this man be that. But in order to be God, he had to know the end from the beginning. So in order to, to foreknowledge uh, that he knew, he would say this, this would happen and that would happen because he was God and knew every, where everything would be placed. And therefore, he could ordain certain things for certain ages. You believe that? Well, that, that's... That's truly scriptural. Now, if you're just going to play with the word foreknowledge and predestination, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. If, if you just play with this, foreknowledge means to look forward to the destination, and predestination goes back to foreknowledge and then takes you back to destination. Well, the word predestination means predetermined. Your destiny is pre, predestiny. It's set. You, you know, every seed after its kind. Now, it doesn't mean that every mistake you make, God pre-planned pre that. No, that's not it. He gives you a choice. But your destiny is set. Now, this is where the confusion comes in. People are okay with God foreknowing, but they are opposed to God predetermining, which is exactly what predestination actually means. Now, from the, from the questions and answers, Brother Brown said, now let's just start reading here in Ephesians, the first chapter. Now, the first thing I want, you, uh, want to say is this. Predestination is a bad word for a minister to use before an untrained uh, congregation. Now, it's not a bad word, but it's a bad word before an untrained congregation. You are not an untrained congregation. You've been well trained. All right. See, it is. I don't use it sometimes here at the church, but out in the audiences, out in the big, you know, where everything's piled in, in from everything, I watch that word. I always use the word foreknowledge because predestination is only the foreknowledge of God. God being infinite, by foreknowledge, he knew everything, or he is infinite. See, see, he knew what would happen, but so by foreknowledge, he could predestinate. Now, what did he just say here? He said that God being infinite, in, order, in, in other words, God being omniscient, all-knowing, could predestinate. So God knows what he is going to predestine or predetermine to the outcome of. Now, look, the scripture is replete with words like predestination, predestinated, ordained, etc., uh, elect, you know, all the same thing. And this morning, we're going, to, we're going to talk on these definitions because unless you understand the Bible terms, you will never understand the Bible doctrine. That's the problem with people have with Godhead. They just don't understand a son has a beginning. If they could just know that one thing, a son has a beginning, then they wouldn't say that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God the Son. All right? Now, in this, in this next quote, <clears throat> William Brown tells us how it is that God could foreordain some to glory and some to condemnation. From faith of Abraham, he said, And predestination is a hard word among a congregation of people because predestination, well, really, foreknowledge is a better word, and predestination looks back to foreknowledge, and foreknowledge looks on to destiny. Yeah. Sure. That is because to foreknow the destiny means you know the destiny or the outcome before it even takes place. 
that God, being infinite in the beginning, knew the end from the beginning. Therefore, he knew what people would do so, or would do, so he, he could foretell what would take place. For he knew, he knew what would be. Therefore, now it sounds like God's leaving it all up to us. It sounds like it. God's leaving it all up to us, but because he knows what you're going to do, uh, therefore he can predestinate. That's not what he's saying. Because he goes right to Paul. Therefore, before Esau or Jacob, either one was born, God could say, Esau I've hated and Jacob I've loved. Because he foreknew what they, would, what they could be. Not what they could be. What they were going to be. He never made Esau the way he was. He wasn't willing that Esau would be that way, but Esau, by choice, God knew would take, would take that way. <clears throat> How did God know that he would take that way? Because he wasn't predestined with the seed of God. He wasn't a predestined seed of God. He wasn't a weak to begin with. He was an Esau. See? But Esau, by choice, now God knew what would take place. So that's how he knows us today. He knows your heart. And, and you might be able to fool your neighbor. You might be able to fool your pastor. But you'll never be able to fool God because he knows your heart. Now, from when their eyes are open, he said, now, if I, if I let you out in time, I, I, I wouldn't have time to call a prayer line up here. Although I think that you got a prayer cards. You don't need to get up here, but just be, just God's just as great out there as he is anywhere. Now he now you believe he's on on the present. Certainly he is. His his he's um, omnipresent because he's omniscient. Now he knows about the end because him being the omniscient, being omniscient, he knows all things. So therefore he's everywhere by being omniscient. Just like the word predestinate, it's a bad word. I, I used to feel it. But now, again, he's not saying it's a bad word. It's a bad word to use to an untrained audience. All right. Because if he says it's a bad word and it's in the Bible, then he's wrong. So, he, and we know he wasn't wrong, he's vindicated, so he's not saying the word itself is bad. He's saying it's misunderstood by people. So it's a bad word to use because it, to a congregation of, of, of people that are not trained. So therefore he's everywhere being omniscient. Just, okay. <clears throat> now many people don't believe in predestination. Predestination is a bad word. It's really foreknowledge. God knows before who will and who won't. So therefore, he can predestinate by his foreknowledge. That's the reason he knows who will and who won't. See, you know, he, he's not willing that any should perish, but he knows who would perish. If he wasn't, then he wasn't God. Now, notice he keeps coming back to this. God, by foreknow foreknowledge, predestines. All right? Now, predestinate means to predetermine the destiny. So God, by foreknowledge, pre-being omniscient, knows the destiny of everything he creates. And remember, he ordained some for glory, but others were of old ordained to condemnation. That's the scripture. Now, from super sign, he says, God knows the end from the beginning. Therefore, he could plan everything. Now you're getting into predestination, the plan. That it would work out just to his glory. That gives us courage to know that no matter what, what comes or goes, God is, God is making everything. The clock is ticking just exactly on time. Now, notice again, you cannot get away from what he is saying here. God, by omniscience, knows how many times the gnat will, will bat his eyes and how many fleas it takes to make a pound of tallow. So God, by foreknowledge, predetermines who will be glorified and who will not accept his doxa and thus will not be glorified. Now, so far, people will, will, will still think that they have something to say in whether they make it or whether, or whether they don't. In other words... They put more on their own choice than they do on God's choice. But that's not a correct assertion. From his sermon, Abraham in his seed, he says, But you see, Abraham, not being nothing himself, he was called by election. What's election? It's be, you elect somebody, what's that? You choose that person, right? So, he was called by God's choosing. Then if Abraham was called by election or God's choosing, then see, his seed after him has to be called by election or God's choosing as well. That's right. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first, and all that the Father will give me will come to me. Now, so, if God's just looking at the end product and says, well, okay, I know that they're going to reject, therefore, you know, they're, they're, I'm going to predestine that, them to, uh, to condemnation, then throw out this, what he just said. It doesn't make any sense. All the Father has given me will come to me. Well, if they weren't given to him, Who's in charge of the giving of, to, uh, to him? God. Right? So if God didn't do it, it ain't going to get done. You see? That's the reason you just preach the gospel in its plainness, yet the elected sheep of God 
would hear that and catch it right quick, and they'll believe that the baptism of the Holy Ghost, where others will walk away and make fun of it because they were elected to hear it. They were chosen to hear it. Now, that's all, see? So, you see now why that the church itself is an elected, pre-elected, pre-elected by God, pre-elected by God, foreknowledge of God. Pre-elected by God, before the foundation of the world, chosen. Now, let me take the word out of First Thessalonians, the first chapter, uh, there where, where he said predestinate. Now, that's not a good word to use before people because predestinate is, it, it would be better if we used it like, like this, that it was by the foreknowledge, God by his foreknowledge could predestinate to his own glory. See? All right, again, from Manifested Sons of God, we find out now back in Genesis and Revelation, Revelation 17 and 8, that he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. Now the word, now let me read the next one. Foundation of the word that we should be holy and without blame before him, uh, having predestinated us. Now I want to stop on that word predestinate. Now predestinate isn't say uh, I'll choose Brother Neville and, and I won't choose Brother Beeler. That isn't it. It's the foreknowledge of God that knowed which one would be right and which one wasn't right. All right. So by foreknowledge, God knowing what he was going to do, he predestinated by his foreknowledge to make all things work together for the good to them that love God, that he might, in the age that is to come, call all things together in one, which is Christ Jesus. Again, it is not God knowing what choice you would make, but rather God placing in you his seed so that you can make the right decision. Now, it sounds like he's saying, well, God did actually make a Brother Beeler to be this way and Brother Neville to be this way. Well, if God didn't make them, who did? You know, listen, both of them were preachers. <clears throat> and Brother Brown said God fashions him. He, he fashions him like a bell. He, he makes him to say exactly uh, what he's going to say in the way he says it. He gives him, gives him his temperament and everything else. Why do you think they, they, God tries them and tests them and molds them and shapes them? Well, if God doesn't do it, who's doing it? The devil? People want to blame things on God all the time. They say, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, they... Oh, my poor child, this and that, you know, uh, it, it's all God's fault. Well, no. When the trials come, it's God's will to let the devil do it, but it's not God doing it. Satan came to God and said, you know, do you want me to beat up on uh, Job? He said, well, he said, just don't take his life. All right. Again, it's not God knowing what choice you would make, but rather God placing in you his seat, God choosing. From faith, he says, what if you were predestinated or predestined by foreknowledge to never receive Christ? That's a tricky word. What if you were predestined, predestinated, or predestinated by foreknowledge to never receive Christ? You know, that's so. The Bible said that men of old were foreordained. Foreordained means chosen to this condemnation to turn the grace of God into lascivious. Jude, fourth chapter. Again, see, when you look at predestination and you look at foreknowledge, they're two different words. Two different things. So Brother Brown said, let's go back to foreknowledge. Okay, foreknowledge. Now, before you have predestination, what happens? For knowledge, God says you're in his thoughts or you're not in his thoughts. Now, then God chooses, all right? He says, I've chosen you and you and you and you, you to be sons of God. I didn't choose the others. So I've got a plan for you, and that's this. Their plan is there's nothing there that's, that, that's attracted to God, so they will always repel. Okay, that's how you can look at foreknowledge and predestination. Predestination itself doesn't mean that, um, um, well, it just means predetermined. So you have the foreknowledge, foreknowledge, you were in his thoughts, he predetermines your path, he chooses which ones, and then he predetermines that path so that all things will work together for the good. Now, that doesn't mean that every decision you've made in your life, God predestined you to that decision no that's where you come in that's where your free will comes in you can you can choose to follow god or choose to be taken off the scene remember brother brown talked about the, the man who said if you're really a son of god and you don't and you don't come to uh to take the correction he's god will just take you home won't mess with you so from god's covenant with abraham now jesus didn't come to calvary just for a haphazard thought well, I'll die up there. Perhaps maybe somebody will feel sorry for me and come down and get saved. Well, when you say God predestines because he could foreknow and he knew what you would do, that's saying the same thing as he said right there. 
Well, perchance, you know, maybe some will make the right decision. Maybe they won't. It's not what he's saying. He's saying that would be haphazard for God to set a plan based on what you're going to do, based on your decisions that you make. How could God say before he was even in the belly of his mother, I ordained Jeremiah to be a prophet? How could he say 150 years before Cyrus was born, my servant Cyrus, who will do this and this and this? Did he roll the dice? Uh, oh, it'll come up. Okay, Cyrus is going to do it. Well, God don't believe in dice. You don't need dice. Men of old were orda foreordained, foreordained before the foundation of the world to this condemnation to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. From God's covenant with Abraham, he said, now, Jesus didn't come to Calvary just for a haphazard thought. Well, I'll die up there. Perhaps maybe somebody will feel sorry for me and come down and get saved. No, no, God don't run his office that way. You don't run your office like that. Jesus come for one specific purpose. That was to redeem those that God foreknew would be redeemed. See, now, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But in order to be God, he had to know. Now, the word predestinate, as is used in First uh, Ephesians 1 and 5, predestinate, there isn't a good word. It means in speaking of predestination of the people sometimes leads them to think that God just predestinated you to push you through a p little pipe and something. That's not right. You see, what he's saying here, and, and, and all these thoughts that he's bringing out, is look, Calvinism, if you go to seed with it, is wrong. People say, well, if I'm ordained to be there, I'll be there so I can do anything I want to do and I'll be there. And that's not what, that's not what he's saying. <clears throat> he's saying if you're ordained to be there, you're going to live a certain way because it's God's way. You understand? Predestination looks back to foreknowledge, foreknowledge to destiny. Now, from Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 6, and then Christ died to save those who God, by foreknowledge, elected to meet him yonder out without spot or wrinkle. Before the foundation of the world, he's seen you in glory. Now, I'd like to ask this question. What man in this world that was ever born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come forth the world speaking lies, um, didn't have spot and didn't have wrinkle? So how does God foreordain you to be without spot or wrinkle? He did it. He did it. <clears throat> By the blood of his son. You see? That's what the Bible said. Ephesians, the first chapter, first verse. God predestinated by foreknowledge. Now, if God did that, predestinated us before the foundation of the world and knew every one of us by name before the foundation of the world and elected us to eternal life and sent Jesus Christ to redeem us. That's 6,000 years ago he saw us. That, he might appear to, that we might appear to his praises, to the praise of his glory. Then how can you ever be lost? <clears throat> okay. If God did the same for everybody in the earth, how could they be lost? How could any be lost? But he knew there'd be some ordained to condemnation. What does that mean? Elected to condemnation. They weren't in his thinking to be filled with glory, his mind, his opinions. You see, here's the thing. You cannot take one of these words and use it by itself. They all work together. God being omniscient, he foreknew. And thus elected or chose, and in choosing, who, who would and who would not, he then sets your path to achieving the predestinated destiny. 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit, now listen, but God hath revealed them unto us by what? His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of God? A, a, a man saith the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God knows. See, there's that omniscience of God knowing. Notice Paul says man doesn't know, but God knows. And then he says in the next verse, and now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. <clears throat> All right. Now, in a couple weeks from now, we're going to go into, I'm going to show you the evidence of, of you know, uh, of, of, being filled with the Holy Ghost. But notice, okay, so how do you know? By having God's Spirit in you, right? Yet we know that God is sovereign and gives His Spirit to whom He wishes. Therefore, we are also told that it is not a matter of your choosing to know, for we read in 1 John 1 and 4, I mean John 1 and 4, in Him was life, and the life was the light. Now I want you to understand these things. The life was the light. 
put anything under a bushel, put it in the basement, hide it away, it doesn't grow, it needs light. Light brings life, all right? The life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might, might believe. Remember, John saw the light coming down, entering into Jesus. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. John wasn't that light. William Brown wasn't that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That light was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man. Every man. He said, the light, the darkness comprehended it not. Every man, every man. Do you believe the Bible? Now, tell me how that light lights every man that comes into the world. What is the light? The Logos. We're getting here something that I, want, I just want to show you. Now, not to get off the subject, but I want to stop here and mention that Brother Derek sent me an article that said the same thing as we just read by the Apostle John. Science has recently been able to see that every time a sperm comes in contact with an egg and the egg becomes germinated, there is a spark of light that takes place at the exact moment the sperm cell penetrates the egg. Whether it be animal or human, there is a spark of light that brings life. Now this is really wonderful. Now we know that in the beginning God spoke and there was light. Genesis 1 and 3. And that light was the Logos of God. And that light brought life. It birthed the Son of God. Now we could go and take a whole sermon on that. Probably ten sermons on that. But we don't have time. And the light brought life. It birthed the Son of God, which is John 5, 26, in the Father's life and gave the life to the Son. Proverbs 8, 20, 22 to 35, it tells the whole story of creation before the creation. How, how before all that was, God birthed forth, he brought forth his Son. Now I wish I had time to get into this, but those who like to study the Word will take these notes and scriptures and have a glorious time studying it out. Anyway, the light being Logos brought forth life. Light brings life. Now, for man that can turn on the light, Brother Bram said, all life, all life, all life, not just those that are born again, all life. So life is only by the word of God made manifest. Life comes only by the word of God made manifest. As long as it is in the book like this, it still can, can be questioned. But when it's made manifest, then you see the product of what is spoken of, of being manifested, then that light is on the word. See, that, that's what brings. The word says so, and then when it comes to pass, that is the life in light. Light bringing life. Light brings life. Plant, plant the weed out here. It'll, you put it in a basement, cover it all over, it'll never bring forth anything because it can't. There's no light there. But as soon as light strikes it, then it'll bring forth life in its germanized seed. Or germanized seed. Remember, <clears throat> Ephesians 5.13 says, what is manifest is manifest by the light. In other words, what is manifest? What is manifest? It shows there's life there. You know, if there's no manifestation, it's still in a seed form or still in a spirit form, right? That is the same thing that science has just now proven. It took from until 2014 to prove what a vindicated prophet taught us back in 1963. That 51 years ago, oh, we've had pretty good. If science could only have accepted what the vindicated prophet taught us, they would have saved themselves 51 years of research. And then Brother Bram makes another outstanding statement when he says that's the same thing it is in the Word. See, the Word is God, and when the light, life strikes, it, it brings it, it, the light strikes it, it brings the Word to life again. Every age has always been that. So he's saying everything that lives has life. He says, and it's the same thing with being a son of God, being born of the Word. When the light strikes that Word, that seed of God in you, it brings forth life. So, and so the same way that the Logos brings life into the world, still by the striking light, uh, uh, the light striking the seed and germinating it, so does the glorious light of God, the Logos of God, anoints the soul of man who hears the word, recognizes it, which is a germination, and then acts upon it, showing it has been quickened to life. Now I'm going to show you something here in just a second. I'm going to show you some pictures. But from a certain science, and yet the man, somewhere down in him, somewhere in him, uh, he could only let that little, as I illustrated, like a button, when a man's saved, that much of him is God. And he shows a little button on his shirt. So that, much, that much of him is God. That's that little light that comes in to make him quit doing what's wrong. Now, if, if you can take all the malice and everything, strife and unbelief, that little button light of the light of the power of God will keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, crowding out unbelief. 
And you don't do it by exhortation or bodily exercise. You do it by the sanctified, consecrated life that the Holy Spirit moves through you. So, you know, sometimes we have people that say, well, you know, boy, I don't, man, the way I've been acting, I just don't know if I got the Holy Ghost. Well, you know what? He probably took a flight. You see, Brother Brown said, you can, you know, he's, he's timid. He's like a dove. You, you get into that cantankerous way, you know, the Holy Ghost will just sit there out and limb. He'll just kind of let you fuss and stew and everything else. And, 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 and uh, you know, you got to go through it until you just say, hey, I'm, I'm dying to myself. I'm tired of this. I'm just dying. Then you get that sweet nature on you. You come back in. Now, here's he says. It's like a little light. And it grows and grows and grows. It'll take over. From the message why, he says, now, to you people that wanted to renew the joy of your salvation and you that somewhere you've lost that joy. Now, think back what you did. Did you neglect prayer meeting? Why don't you have the joy of the Lord in your life? Well, did you neglect prayer meeting? Neglect reading the Bible? Neglect praying at your home? Asking the blessing at the table? Don't never do that. Oh my, well that's, a, that's so unbecoming to Christians. No matter where you are, bow your head and pray. Like Brother Brown said, the pig is, you know, the pig is the only one that doesn't lift his head up. All right. No matter where you are, bow your head and pray. Don't be ashamed of him. Pray any, anywhere, see? And, it, and if ever where you, lo you left that joy, that whatever weeded it out, what little root of bitterness come in, <clears throat> remember, when a man is saved, this much, like this little button here, becomes eternal life in your heart. That's God. That's God. As you're able to push out all the roots of bitterness, then God begins to spread in you. Then you become a son of God. A man was made to be God, to be a God. Do you, do you know that? He's in the image of God. He's the son of God. He's, he's like him. He was given a domain, Genesis 126, dominion over the, over the whole earth. That's right. He ruled the earth. He ruled the animal kingdom and all the other kingdoms, all but the kingdom of God. He was a, he was a, a God, or he was God. He, he was made an amateur God. He was made in the image of God, made like God. Uh, God had hands and feet like God. He was in the image of God. What happened? Because he disbelieved God's word, it sent him right back out to shift for himself. Now, God's trying to bring him back, and when you have faith and accept him, my brother, just let that little light begin to grow out, taking all the roots of doubt and bitterness, yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Ghost will take out all that negativity. But you don't want to let it go. Why don't you want to let it go? Do you have comfort in negativity? Do you have comfort in being a sourpuss all the time? Always in interfering in everybody? In, in what they do, what they say? Oh, I've got to have, I got to interfere with that? That's not the Holy Ghost. Let it go. Just let it go. Then you begin to become a son and daughter of God. Begin to grow in the grace of God. The Holy Spirit begins to build his kingdom with you, within you. Now, from the Messiah, he said, Now, for instance, when a man gets saved, he's just about like the light that comes into him is about like uh, this little white button on, on my shirt. That's when God comes into the inner part of the man. In the inner part of the man, a man is made up in the system of tabernacle in the outer courts, uh, then holy place and the holiest of holies, the Shekinah glory on the inside of that veil. Okay? So get back to the article that we see here a picture of light bursting when the sperm penetrates the egg and there is a burst of light, energy, life, and this is the point of conception. So the light of God is still creating just like it did back in Genesis 1 and 3. You know, we teach children, well, we're all creations of God. But we don't really believe that because we say, well, you know, God did it one time, so therefore it's good enough for all of us. God created Adam and Eve, so therefore we're a creation of God because we came from, from Adam and Eve. No, science has proven every time there is a birth, every time, excuse me, every time there is a conception, there is that flash of logos. Now they call it um, zinc. They call it zinc. Zinc ions or something like that. It's a flash of light. It sparks it. Remember Paul says, and you hath he what? Quickened. What's that? That's that flash of light. The Holy Ghost coming in like a little button. All right? Which made way for Genesis, Genesis 1, 3. You know, God spoke. The light appeared. Made way for Genesis 1, 11. Every seed after his kind. Made way for Genesis 1, 26. And God created man in his image. The light coming into man. 
And let's face it, every man and animal is still a creation of God by the same process of light striking the seed, the light bursting forth a living creation of God still to this day. But what is more important is when the very life of God comes into the soul, as Brother Branham said in his previous quotes. Why is it that when your, your, your heart has stopped, they give you a shock? Oof. What is that shock? It's electricity, right? What is electricity? It's light. Oof. They're trying to bring back light because light is life. Here's a picture science has taken of the light burst at the point of conception. So you see the sperm coming in, the little red thing there coming in, and then all of a sudden you see, boom! Now they said they've actually counted 8,000 little particles of light. 8,000. Scientists captured the flash of light that sparks when a sperm meets an egg. The article. For the first time ever, science, scientists have captured images of the flash of light that sparks at the very moment of human cell, sperm cell makes contact with an egg. The phenomenon has, uh, has been observed in, in animals before, but no one's ever seen the spark of human conception. And what's even more incredible is the fact that some eggs burn brighter than others which is a direct indication that their ability to develop into a healthy embryo, a team from Northwestern University found. So why do sparks literally fly at the moment of conception? Well, back in 2011, the, Nor the Northwestern team discovered that sparks of zinc exploded at the point of conception in mice. It took them a few years to figure out how to image this event. But in 2014, they'd managed to film the event for the first time ever and watch as billions of zinc atoms were released at the exact moment when an animal's egg is pierced by a sperm cell. Now back to John and 1. And we'll pick up at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, exousia, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So if, you're, if your new birth does not come by an, an act of your flesh, nor does it come by the will of man, but of God, then it is not what you chose, but what God chose. He is sovereign in his choosing. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now I would say this, <clears throat> that when that spark of light comes in and quickens you, you're a son. You're now a son. You've got the life of God in you. But it doesn't stop there. That son has got to grow, grow, grow. Like Brother Brown said, there's a growing, 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 growing. There's a word upon word upon word upon word. You're a born one. But are you ready for adoption? You're somewhere in between. All of us right now are somewhere between being born and being fully adopted. Now, if you're not fully adopted, you don't get no inheritance. I'm sorry for you. Except you get, I guess you'll, you'll still be in the new earth. But you don't get no inheritance. All right? So God, by foreknowledge, saw who was going to respond to that word and therefore will be adopted and therefore he predestinates you to the adoption of children. Okay. Science. Somehow, when that spark goes off, the egg in some, oops, let me go back. The egg in some gets really bright. It means there's got, it's got, it's going to have good life. Egg in some, not so bright. Still there, the light's still in that seed. It's still going to bring forth a child. And when the Holy Ghost, when his word quickens you, in some, it's going to bring forth an adopted son. Some, it's just going to bring forth a son. You see how the natural types of spiritual? He was in the world. The world was made by him. All creation made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, exousia, an ability to make a right decision, to become, to grow into sonship of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So if your new birth does not come by an act of your own flesh, 
nor the will of man, but of God, then it is not what you chose, but what God chose. He is sovereign in his choosing. Therefore, you can go back to foreknowledge. You go back to, then you go to election. Then you go to predestination. The foreknowledge and election come before predestination. Then God can see the end, the product of what he chose, what he predestined. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, next week we're going to get more into these definitions of foreknowledge, election, predestination. And then in two weeks I'm going, to, I'm going to show you how that the evidence of the new birth is that God teaches you and you receive it and you live it. Because if you don't live it, you didn't receive it. You see, if there's no sanctification, there wasn't any justification either. Right? If there's no baptism of the Holy Ghost, there wasn't a, there wasn't a sanctification. And there wasn't, a, there wasn't a justification either. Just because you spoke in tongues doesn't mean diddly squat. I know people that claim that they got the Holy Ghost when they spoke in tongues, they've been married several times. Three times. The evidence, okay, and that's the difference between the two vines. The one is ordained to glory while the other is ordained to condemnation. So Paul goes on in verse 14, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them for, uh, because they are spiritually discerned. So if the person is left in the natural state, naturally they will be ordained to the condemnation. All right. So how does God know the end from the beginning? Because he, as God chose some to be glory and some just left them left them to themselves you know go back to, to go back to Psalm 1 you know God God leaves them to themselves if they're not his therefore unless you're spirit filled you will never know the things of God and therefore never do what the things of God calls you to do and therefore your end will be condemnation but he that is spiritual, he that is spirit-filled, judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we do have the mind of Christ. Now thus men will teach, God being omniscient, and knowing the end from the beginning, knew who would and who would not, and based on upon this foreknowledge, God then elects those to glory who choose right, and he, and he elects to condemnation those who do not choose right. In believing this, however, men place man's ability to choose above God's sovereign will, and thus they fall into error. And unless you understand these terms for knowledge, election, and predestination, you will get even you will even get confused by what we have quoted from Brother Branham as saying, because he was talking to a people who were opposed to the word predestination. I once attended a seminar by a man who was considered uh, to be the evangelist, uh, evangelical's most brilliant scholar. His name is Dr. Norman Geisler. Dr. Geisler has so many degrees you could plaster a wall with him. He has a bachelor's of theology from William Tyndale College. He has a master's in theology from Wheaton College, the same college Billy Graham made famous by graduating from it. And then he has a PhD from where? Loyola University. Loyola University and Wheaton College, how do they match? They're both Trinitarians. They're all Catholic, it doesn't matter. If you're baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you're according to Catholic, uh, uh, the Vatican, according to their teaching, you're Catholic. You don't even know it. A PhD from Loyola University, which is a Catholic university named after the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius Loyola. So that ought to tell you how much discernment and revelation this man has. And yet he's considered their top theologian. But being he is the preeminent doctor of theology among the evangelicals, he, it ought to tell you also that he is a dyed-in-the-wool Trinitarian, which is actually just another pseudonym for the Babylonian triad of Anu, Ea, and Enlil. Anna being the father of the gods, Ea being the son of the father, and Enel being the, we, being the wind or spirit. Now sometime, if ever we get the opportunity, I'd like to take the time, if we ever get a chance, and go into the pagan triads of ancient Babylon, Egypt, Rome, and Greece to show you uh, that they were all the same false worship of a satanic deity. Now, if you don't have it, I would recommend that you get two, Hislop's Two Babylons. You can download it from Amazon for 99 cents on your iPad or, or your you know, in a um, Kindle format. Or I've got it in a PDF. If you want a copy of it, just I'll, I'll email it to you. Just let me know. But it's, it's, it's tremendous. It's a, it's, very it's, it's a very studious book. I mean, it's very deep. 
All right. Lot, there's so much information there that it's, it's like Sarah said the other day, having too many options, you know, kind of boggles your mind. You'd like to just make a kind of simple cut. And, well, but for those who like to study, it's a great book to study. Now, from the Encyclopedia, Brother Bram mentioned it many times. Now, from the Encyclopedia Britannica, we read Enlil, also known as Enlil, or uh, Nunamnir, was the Sumerian god of the air, all right, like spirit, in the Mesopotamian pantheon, uh, but was more powerful than any other elemental deities and eventually was worshipped as king of the gods. All right, he was the son of the god of the heavens, Anu, also known as An. You see how people mix up the Holy Spirit with the Son of God? It's Babylonian triad. All right. And with Anu and Enki, God of wisdom, formed a triad which governed the heavens, earth, and underworld, or alternatively, the universe, sky, and atmosphere, and earth. After Anu, Enlil, uh, Enlil was the most powerful of the Mesopotamian gods, keeper of the tablets of destiny which contained the face of gods in humanity and considered an unstoppable force whose decisions could not be questioned. So that's, that is your basis for the Trinity, which went from Babylon to China, then to Egypt, then to Rome, then to Greece, and from there it was adopted in 325 by the Catholic Church at the Council of Nicaea. Anyway, Dr. Geisler is famous for his four-volume book set called Systematic Theology, and says in another book entitled, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> I don't understand how anybody can be a defender of the gospel and believe in a Babylonian triad. But attending a seminar back in 1978, I was interested in how the so-called defenders of the faith looked at certain Bible truths. So I asked him, I mean, I sat from here to about where Gary's at, away from him. I was sat in the front row. And I asked him, I, I, I asked him about predestination. I said, why don't you explain to me predestination? And I, I said, why don't you explain to me Godhead? And so, you know, he, in the Godhead, he said, well, it's like a triangle. And you have, you know, have a father here and son here and, you know, three different persons, but they, they actually make up the triangle. Oh, okay. That's as good as you can do? And I said, well, how about if we say it's like water and ice and vapor? It's all the same stuff. Oh, no, 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 that, that, that's not it. It's, it's three, actually. Okay. I said, well, what about predestination? So he explained predestination this way. He said, if you were up on top of a building and you're looking down and there's a there's a road coming this way and a road coming this way and you can look because you're at the corner you can see two cars are heading for a collision he said now you didn't make them collide but you knew they're going to collide just by the base of their speed <clears throat> well just a minute what if one decides to put on the brakes now your predestined thought now your foreknowledge is out the door because somebody decided at the last minute to, to make a different choice you understand? This is what they think. If God made wheat and he made briars, he didn't, he didn't put in his plan that a briar could become a wheat. If the Son of Man went forth sowing and the devil went forth sowing and you have two seeds growing up, one's a child of God, one's not a child of God, they can't intermix. Serpent seed cannot become Son of God. I'm sorry, they can't. So where does your choice have? Your choice has nothing. Not by the will of man, nor by the will of flesh, but of God. <clears throat> you see? Then he went on to say, well, I'm not responsible for the crash. I knew it was coming. And you say, well, that's God and our free moral agency. God knows all things knows who will and who will, will not choose him, and so he doesn't shove you through a tube and then hold you responsible. He just knows your end from the beginning. Now, it sounds a little bit like what Brother Brown was saying, but he wasn't because Brother Brown kept going back to election. God before elected, God before elected, God before chose. Now, that might have give you a warm fuzzy about God, but it doesn't hold up in the court of God's word. Therefore, in order to believe this, you must be willing to throw out entire passages of Scripture, and you must be willing to believe that man is capable on his own of making a correct choice, and man cannot. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is a way of death. God knows your end from the beginning because he predetermined your end. That is what the word predestinate means. It means to predetermine, to mark out beforehand. That's what the word predestination in the Greek means, to mark out beforehand your destiny. Therefore, predestination is the path you are destined to take. 
Now let's turn to the word now and examine the very scripture that must be relegated to the trash heap in order to prove free will has anything to do with God's election. In John 15 and 16, Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, we can stop right here and rest our case. Either this is meant for all believers or it's not. If it is not, then all believers are not expected to bring forth fruit, and all believers are not entitled to ask the Father in the name of Jesus and expect to receive what they ask for. But Jesus tells us here that we did not choose him first. Rather, he chose us, and our love toward him and acceptance of him is only in response to his choice. In John 4, uh, 1 John 4 and 19, we hear Jesus say, we love him, or John say, we love him because he first loved us. Now, either this is true or it's not true. Then if this is not true, we must rip this out of the Bible. And if this passage is an error, then what else is an error? If we believe God wrote the word, that his Bible is the unadulterated word of God, then we must accept what it tells us. Scripture does not fight scripture. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, we read, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are on the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he, he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto their fathers, that... Um, uh, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the, ha the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth the covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. And he will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him face to his face. Again, we see that it was not our choosing, but God's choosing that's involved here. Now, Brother Bram's sermon, Divine Healing, he says, <clears throat> he made it clear that our election is sovereign and left to the choice of God and not to ourselves. He said, listen, it's not him that wants to get saved that's saved. Well, then that ought to throw out the thing. Well, God, you know, he knew that you'd want to be saved, and so therefore he saves you. That throws that out. So how can you balance this quote here with the other things over there? Unless you understand foreknowledge, election, predestination, the words, the terms. What they actually mean. It's not him that wants to get saved that's saved. It's him that's saved by God's choice. By God's choice. Not by, see, it's not, you know, born of God, not of the will of man, not of, the, not, of the, not of blood, not of the will of man, nor of the works of the flesh, or will of the flesh, but of God. All right? It's not him that wants to get saved that's saved. It's him that's saved by God's choice. Esau wanted to get saved too. He wept bitterly and couldn't find no place to repent. He wanted to get saved. It ain't because you wanted to get saved. God said, I, I've hardened who I will harden. I have mercy on whom I will have mercy. That's right. He said, before Esau or Jacob, either was born, not knowing right or wrong, so it didn't have anything to do with their decision. God said, I love Jacob and I hated Esau. And Esau tried to get right with God and couldn't. Pharaoh tried to get right with God and couldn't do it. So it's not you, not what you want. It's what God has ordained for you to do. That's right. Paul said in the ninth chapter of Romans there, hasn't the potter got power of the clay to make an, uh, an honored vessel or a dishonored vessel to show his glory to those uh, who, he, who he has honored? You didn't know that, did you? Well, that's what the scripture says. Pharaoh tried his best to repent. He was kind-hearted. He said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Go on. God said, no, you, you, no, you won't. I'm going to harden his heart so you can't go. Because God's word has to be fulfilled. And if we're living in this day when formalities and things has broken the church down, broken away, why is God's word being fulfilled? As sure as God said these signs should follow them that believe, as sure as God said these churches would be like that they are now, God also said this opposition would meet it. So the same God that ordained signs and wonders ordained that these should be persecuting against it. So there you are. If you're on the other side, I feel sorry. And I want, you, I want you not to be that way, but maybe you can't help it. See, God might have fixed it that way. Well, that almost sounds like shoving through a tube, don't it? But it's not, because see, the decisions are still left up to you. Listen, the Bible tells us several times, Pharaoh repented. Pharaoh said, okay, go. Okay, go. Then his heart got hard. No, you can't go. Then trials. Okay, go. Then trials lift. Okay, you can't go. <clears throat> it wasn't in his heart to begin with. 
because he wasn't made that way. In Proverbs 14, 12, we read, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The scripture tells us that God will try to, uh, uh, that man will try to choose what seems right or the way that he believes to be the right way. But man's choice will always lead to the way of death. Therefore, even in our choosing, we need a God who will watch over our choice and help us to make the right decision. That's why in Psalm 1, it speaks of the, of the, of the man of God. It says that, God, it says that he's like a, a, a tree planted by the water and in his fruit will not wither in those things. And he says that, and then the, the, uh, the Lord watches over the way. It's Derek, D-E-R-E-K, not D-A-R-E-K. Derek, it means the way of life. <clears throat> the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the ungodly shall perish. And the word perish is abad. It means they're left to themselves. So you got an active father watching over you, but he doesn't watch over the neighbor's kids. All right. In Philippians 3.15 we read, Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it even unto you. In the following scripture we find God is actively involved with the choices of his, uh, that his elect take. In Psalm 37.23, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. See, God ordered Jonah. <clears throat> Jonah, his way was, Hey, I ain't going to go through that. So God ordered his way. So God said, okay, we'll just predestinate his path. He's going he's gonna, to, well, I know that he, he's still got some unbelief in his heart, so I'm going to really put him to the test. And so he goes out in the water. God brings a storm. They say, well, Jonah says, well, it's, it's because of me. They throw him over. Fish swallows him, brings him right back to where he's supposed to go to begin with. The footsteps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Here we find the Hebrew word kun used for ordered, and it means to set up or to establish, to prepare or arrange. Therefore, we see the hand of God actively involved in the steps of a good man or a righteous man. <clears throat> in Proverbs 16 and 9, we read, A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his footsteps. How many of you wanted to do something in a certain way growing up, and then God turned you around and set your feet? You know, I was going to, I was going to be a professional athlete. God stopped me two weeks into, into, into the professional camp. He said, no, no, no. Look at, look at these guys claim to be Christians. They're wife swapping everything else. So I said, okay, I'm either going to be the best Christian I can be or I'm going to be the best football player. And there's no, it's not even a, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to go with God. All right. So here we find that although a man may contemplate and even plan his way, yet God has the ultimate say-so and will direct the very footsteps of that man. Jonah was a classic example of this. The Lord told him to do such and such, and Jonah uh, had, had what he thought was a better plan. God just took over the situation and produced exactly. That's predestination now, see? God elected him to it, and now God predestinates so that all things work together for the good. So God took over the situation and produced exactly what he intended to produce. Jonah had no choice, or at least his choice meant nothing to what God wanted. And what's even interesting about that is that Jonah, in his unbelief, he actually worked right into the beautiful plan of God because when he came out of that fish, and, 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 the, and, the, and the God of Nineveh was the fish, and when this guy came out of the fish, they said he's got to be a prophet. In Jeremiah 1 and 5 we read, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah could no more get away from what he was called to be if he tried. For this very reason he was born, and remember, Jonah tried to run from it, but God would not let him. So much for our, 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 our will making our destiny. <clears throat> so much for our choice. Now, I would just say this. If you read the scripture and it was cooking to you that you were one of those people in God before the foundation of the world ordained to the adoption of Jesus Christ why don't you step into it it's what he's called you to William Branham when he found out you know he was ordained to be the, the prophet messenger to this age he stepped into it nothing could pull him out of it why do you let friends or family or whatever pull you out of being a son of God hey this is what God called me to this is what I'm going to do all right that's what Jeremiah, Jeremiah succumbed to the will of God. We all do. We also find in the book of Acts 13, 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life, they believed. Sure, why not? If we are, if we are to believe this scripture, then we must acknowledge that all who are ordained to eternal life will believe. Then those who are not ordained to eternal life will not believe, and there is your evidence of election. 
in, in 1 Corinthians 2 and 7, but we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world, before the world unto our glory. He ordained it before the world unto our glory. So you had to be here to get it, right? Ephesians 1 and 4, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him or in his presence, in love having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now if God had a word, which he ordained before the world began, and if that word was to produce glory in a chosen people or a people of God's choosing, then there had to be a people in God's mind before the world began who would at the right season believe this predestined word and receive the glory it was ordained to produce. So there had to be a people that were here to receive the, the pillar of fire, the message, the glory that God brought down. Step into it. That's it. Now, just, just as there are those who are ordained to glory and to eternal life, we also find there are those who are ordained to condemnation. Jude 1 and 4. For there are certain men, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of God into the lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul shoots the theory that speaks of free moral agency as a root cause for election in pieces in Romans 9 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, having made no choices, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that called. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. What shall we then say? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he, he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So, then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So your choice has nothing to do with it. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and, and, and whom he will he hardens. Thou wilt then say, say unto me, well, why does he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath that the potter power of the clay of the same lump to make one vessel to honor, and another to dishonor? In other words, how can you ever get angry with God for something that takes place? As if it's, well, why do you do this? Who are you? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are when the creator of the heavens and the earth does something and you say, well, I, I, I'm angry. He should have done it this way. He should have done it my way. Well, you're, you're more omniscient than God. You know more than God. Well, well, why doesn't my mother believe? Maybe she wasn't ordained to believe. Why did my son believe? My children believe. Maybe they weren't ordained to believe. Give God the praise. Give God the glory. Just trust in, just, look, just trust that somehow, some way, they'll be there. And if they're not, I'm sure all those things will be wiped from your memory. You'll never even know it. <clears throat> because who is, like Jesus said, who is my mother? Who is my father? But they that do the will of God. You could have a mother or a father that are total unbelievers. They won't make it. They won't be there. But the reason why they're your mother and father is because there was a spark somewhere through that lineage. And God had to make sure that you look exactly like he saw you before the foundation of the world. So he brought your mother and your father together so that you would get the right DNA to make your image fit with the predestined image that God had for you. So what if there's no life in mom or dad? What if there's no life in the soil, but you take of the soil to make a pot? You understand? It all goes back to God. Give him praise. Give him honor. Like Job, Job, uh, like, uh, like, uh, Job said when his wife said, he said, you speak like a foolish woman. She said, why don't you just curse God? You know, look at all these things God putting on. God putting on. God didn't put it on. He, he said, well, okay, devil, you can have at it. All sons that come to God must first be tried, for, be tested. But he's going to come out like a, like a shining star. But the wife didn't. Well, why don't you curse God? Why don't you just curse God and die the death? He said, thou speaking like a foolish woman. No, but just shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You understand? You don't, you don't mess with God. He's to be worshipped. That's what God means, object of worship. It ain't, it ain't him that willeth. It ain't him that 
runneth, it's God. It's God. It's God. And until you get that in your mind, you're going to backslide daily, a thousand times. Paul makes it very clear that our election is not up to you or I, but entirely up to God. He even goes so far as to say, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, if it is not him that willeth, then you, your will and my will have nothing to do with our election at all. It is God who either chooses to show mercy or not. Therefore, if your will has nothing to do with your being elect, then neither does your choice, for your choice is but a reflection of your will. You will, you will and then you choose. Now, to place knowledge, foreknowledge and election and then predestination into their proper place, we must first know the definitions of each. Therefore, since most people wish that foreknowledge is a preeminent principle behind election, we're going to start at that point, and that's where we'll pick up next week. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we want to thank you, Lord. And Father, there's those who think that I'm angry. I'm not angry, Lord. I just want people to understand. Just quit being stupid. Just quit being stupid. You, don't, you just don't get angry at God. I did it one time in my life. I know. And I tell you what, you made it miserable for me. Uh, you made it miserable for me, Lord. And, and I learned my lesson right quick. Never ever to do that again. It's like a child. Just, you know, a child speaks up or... Or, 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 you know, uh, tries to tell mom and dad what to do, and they get, they get a good, they get a good protoplasmic stimulation. They won't do it again. Father, help us never to do that. Help us to accept, Lord, your will, and to walk in it. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. I'm really excited about this series, and the Lord's already given me the next four sermons. <clears throat> and they're just, oh my, they're just so much, they're just so filled with good, um, good things. It's just, let me just, uh, I got to get out of here and see if I can, uh, there we go. Well, let's just sing that song, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and give thee peace and give thee peace and give thee peace forever.